I am. But I can't. We got to check to see if they're. Good morning and welcome. It's wonderful to see everyone this morning and to be worshiping our Lord with you this morning. Also, those joining us from home, we welcome you and we're happy you're, you've joined us. A few announcements this morning. Communicator articles are due today to Kathy Spohn. Also, our annual picnic is today at 1 o'clock at the Levengood Estate. And that's 2121 Harmonyville Highway. It's right down the road. I was told the lobster tails go in the pot at 1 o'clock. Don't be late. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said anything about lobster tail. <laughs> Patty and Dave uh, welcome us each and every year, and we're very thankful for that. Monday evening... At 6.30, there's an in-person lead team meeting. Wednesday at 10 a.m., the virtual coffee with Judy Turner, your host. On Saturday, we have an 8 a.m. in-person men's breakfast here at the church. The sign-up sheet's on the bulletin board if you can make it. Please add the family of Lisa Moore to your prayer list. Lisa went home to be with the Lord earlier this week. Also add the family of Donald Walls. Celebrating, uh, oh, one more announcement here. We're doing another card greeting project for Kadima residents. There's a box in the uh, fellowship hall for the cards and they're due on September 12th. Does anyone have another announcement they'd like to share this morning? We have a few birthdays this week. On Monday, Donald Schaefer. On Wednesday, Rick Neal. And on Thursday, Scott Moses. Happy birthday to all. Celebrating anniversaries this week. On Thursday, it's Betsy and Richard Wells. And on Friday, Joanne and Jim Wells. Happy anniversary. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Let us pray. Father God, we bring to you our burdens this morning. You know all of our situations. You, we, you know we cannot make it without you. Comfort our hearts, give us strength, and help us to carry on. You alone have the power to make all things new. Lord, help us be a blessing today. Help us to lessen the loads of others. Equip us to encourage and cue us to show compassion. Give us a heart to comfort and not compare and to serve without strife. Lead us to love without conditions and also we pray others will see Jesus in us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our opening song this morning is Seek the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to be the bread of heaven, the bread of life for the world. Forgive us for elevating earthly appetites above devotion to you. Feed us with the knowledge of Christ so that we recognize our sin and gladly repent in his name. We pray for those whose daily need for healthy food, clean water, and proper shelter goes unmet. 
and for those misusing what they have in the vain pursuit of pleasure. And Lord, we particularly lift those who are impacted by fires and other natural disasters, especially those who live in Haiti and impacted by the earthquake this week. Feed them with all the good things of Christ for life now and in eternity. Have mercy on those whose lives have been broken by violence and crime. Feed them with hope and new life in Christ and bless our brothers and sisters in prison and those who minister to them. Feed those who are sick or sorrowing with, or sorrowing with healing and consolation through Christ. We pray particularly for those on our prayer list and meet the needs of others we know personally to be in want and need, whom we now name silently in our hearts. Merciful Father, you heard the prayers of your people in the wilderness and fed them bread from heaven despite their sin. Graciously hear us today and feed us too with the bread of life from heaven, even our Lord Jesus Christ. For he lives and he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Lord, we are bold to pray as your children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please, please stand and, and join with me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning we've highlighted, this morning we've highlighted uh, both in the bulletin and in our, in our weekly update the educational missions that we do and uh, you do, really, through the Board of Global Ministries in Central America and how important they are. But I also want to assure you, and, and you can read that, and I hope you do, I want to assure you that uh, we prayed just a minute ago for the folks in Haiti. I don't know how many of you heard the news this morning with any kind of assessment of the damage there, but this earthquake was in fact larger than the last one that occurred 10 years ago, which devastated the island. It was in a different part of the island, but I want you to know that United Methodist Church is there. You're there providing aid as soon as we can get in, as soon as the church can get in. One of my favorite things to say is, in disaster relief, they talk about two groups, the M&Ms, they call us, the M&Ms, the Methodists and the Mennonites, who are the first in and the last out in helping people not only survive, but thrive in the midst of, of, uh, of some terrible situations. We appreciate your support of, of their work, both foreign lands and right here in the United States, some of it right here in our conference. Thank you. Let's continue our worship as the usher brings our morning offering. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the 
poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. For all you've given us, O Lord, for the many ways you've blessed us, we give you thanks. And now we give to you, along with our lives, a portion of what you've given us for the glorification of your kingdom. Use it as you see fit, and use us as you see fit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today's response of scripture reading is from John chapter 6, verses 51 through 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews debated among themselves, asking, How can this man give his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the human one, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. My flesh is the true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feasts on me lives because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It isn't like the bread your ancestors ate and then they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Let me try that again. Before I begin my sermon this morning, I want to take a moment and apologize. Last week, I mistakenly told you that King Solomon was Bathsheba and David's firstborn. Now, we all know better than that. But what comes out of our mouth sometimes doesn't strike us until somebody points it out. What I should have said is that Solomon was King David and Bathsheba's oldest living son. I want to thank you for the fact checkers, uh, for keeping me honest. We could use a few more, a few, a few more of you as we uh, do the bulletin, and you can proofread it for us and let us know where we've misspelled things. Even if we cut and paste them from someplace else, they show up misspelled sometimes. But my, import, my, my, uh, my integrity is important to me, so please forgive my errors. Let's pray together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that as the word is proclaimed, we may open our hearts and minds and hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today I want to talk about bread. Probably that's an appropriate thing when we're going to a picnic, right? We have bread in one form or another. Have you ever, uh, have you ever thought about bread? You know, bread comes in a variety of forms and it comes with many different recipes. There's banana bread, there's baguettes, there's gluten-free bread, there's bread sticks and brioche and challah and cornbread and faccia and multigrain pita, uh, pita, pumpernickel, rye, soda bread, sourdough, and whole wheat, just to name a few. And bread comes in different forms and shapes. There's, uh, there's just plain, uh, a loaf of bread, there are rolls, there are uh, buns, there are roll, uh, rolls, buns, and what? Well, sliced bread, right? They come in loaf. I'll get this right. It's right in front of me and I still can't read it. There's also plain bread and toasted bread. Me, you know, I like one of those flavored varieties. I like the rosemary and olive oil bread. The problem with bread is that too much of it makes you fat. And like so many other things, it doesn't provide all the nutrients we humans need. 
But bread's important, and it's important in the New Testament. It's important in the Bible for that matter. Jesus tells us when we pray, we should ask for our daily bread, our daily food. He, he feeds a large group twice by taking a couple of small loaves and multiplying them. In one case, there are 12 basketfuls left over after feeding the crowd numbering between 4,000 and 5,000 men. Bread was certainly a common element in the diet of the people of the day. Bread can be good for us. It contains fiber. It, ha it can have a probiotic effect. And according to Gold Medal Bakery in Fall River, Massachusetts, now you don't think that they don't have a stake in the, what I'm gonna say next. We just have to excuse that. Bread contains protein, micronutrients, folic acid. It's low in fat and can decrease the risk of cancer. When Jesus dines for the last time with his disciples, he reinterprets bread for them. But this is not just any meal. This meal is the celebration of the Passover feast. It was a remembrance of God's love for his people as they left Egypt. On the night before, you remember, on the night before the Exodus, the firstborn of every Hebrew family was spared from death when the angel of death took the firstborn of every Egyptian family, even down to their herds and their flocks. But the Egyptian people, you know, they weren't spared. The angel of death came over and took the firstborn. So at his last Passover feast, bread becomes a symbol for Jesus. He takes the bread, he breaks it, and tells those gathered that it is his body. And here in John 6, Jesus talks about the bread of life. Now, now, I need to be honest. Every time I celebrate Holy Communion, though I know what the words mean, I stumble over them. Here's why. For Jews, when Jesus says, what Jesus says is outrageous by talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. In John 6, the crowd gets really upset. Think about how confused those at the meal with Jesus, that last meal, must have been. For Jews, there was a pretty strict food code, eating code. They can't eat pork, fish without scales like lobster or scallops, or anything that flies in swarms like insects. They were forbidden from eating uh, meat and dairy together or in rapid succession. They were not to eat blood. And now here is Jesus telling them to eat human flesh and drink human blood. It sounds like a bad horror movie to me. It really is no wonder that people walked away. Think about it. It sounds gross and crazy for those outside of the faith. And if one is outside the Christian faith, this sounds like cannibalism. But that's only if you take this passage literally, as many people did. In reality, Jesus is not speaking literally. I believe that both here and in the Lord's Prayer, he's talking about our spiritual nourishment. He would never ask his followers to be cannibals or to drink blood. After all, it's forbidden by Jewish law, and Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. So these are his words, though. But if you think about them as symbols of spiritual feeding, they make sense. Let's look a little closer at the context of John's gospel. In the very beginning, John sets the stage. In John 1.14, John writes, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus, in John's sixth chapter, redirects the thinking of the crowd. The crowd wants more food. He's just fed 5,000 men, plus women and children. They were fed, they were full, and he did it all from the lunch of a child and multiplied it so that each one was not only fed, but there was plenty left over. But now, they want more. And in John 6, 26, 
Jesus addresses them. Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. You're not looking for me, not because you saw miraculous, miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. The crowd, Jesus says, is missing the point. They're blinded to the miracle. In verse 27, Jesus elaborates, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed the seal of approval. And in John 6, 51, Jesus redirects their attention from their stomachs to their souls. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Jesus here is referencing the Exodus when God provided manna to the Jews, to the Hebrews, in early every morning, every morning, as long as their journey was. Forty years. Forty years. Now the bread that fell down from heaven, the bread of heaven, couldn't be kept overnight. But God provided every day what the people needed, except on the day before the Sabbath, when there was a double portion, enough to feed the family for two days. The bread from heaven nourishes men and women. Jesus now says that he is the bread from heaven. We can't last long. Now we can last longer without food than we can without water. But we can't last long. When you lose your nourishment, several things begin to happen to you. Now, I don't want anybody comparing these symptoms to your own this morning. You experience fatigue. Okay, half of us are tired. Your hair starts to get thin. Uh-oh. Or you lose it altogether. Fred, I'm sorry. Anemia sets in. Then bone loss. Your muscles become weak, and you get the chills. Somebody complained it was cold in here this morning. You develop dry skin, and your basic cycles of digestion become non-functional. That last stage, the, the, the last stage is a shortness of breath. You cannot live without eating. But eating physical food won't keep you alive forever. Spiritual food does that. How do you get your spiritual nourishment? It's important to consume our daily bread. Just as our physical body is nourished by the physical bread, our spiritual body is nourished with bread from heaven. Spiritual food is transforming. Psychologist Robert B. Cialdini once told of a German soldier during World War I whose job it was to capture enemy soldiers for interrogation. Because of the nature of the trench warfare at the time, it was extremely difficult for enemies to cross the no man's land between the opposing lines. But it was not difficult for a single soldier to crawl across the, the slip and, and slip into the enemy trench. The armies of the Great War had experts who regularly did so to capture an enemy soldier who would then be brought back for questioning. This particular German expert had successfully completed that mission in the past and was sent on another one. Once again, he skillfully negotiated the area between fronts and surprised a lone enemy soldier in his trench. The unsuspecting soldier who had been eating at the time was easily disarmed. The frightened captive with only a piece of bread in his hand then performed what may have been the most important act of his life. He gave his enemy some of the bread. So effective was the German soldier by this gift that he could not complete his mission. He turned from his benefactor and recrossed the no man's land empty handed to face the wrath of his superiors. That act of sharing was in fact for a soldier's the bread of life for that soldier. Now this is a message here. The bread of Christ is not to be hoarded, but to be shared with the world just 
as God has shared the living bread with us, Jesus is not talking here about physical or earthly food, but eternal food. We need to share the eternal food. Have you ever been served a food you didn't recognize? I hear a little sighs here. I see some smiles. Yeah, you, you kind of look at it. And, you think, hmm. and if, you're, if you're blunt, you say, what's this? Some of us haven't, haven't mastered uh, holding that in yet. It's the same question, though, that the Hebrews raised in the wilderness during the Exodus. When God fed them bread from heaven, their first question was, and for many of us, ours as well is, what is it? After all, it was strange. I can imagine that is exactly the question that was on their, the minds of those who heard Jesus teaching. What's this? In the wilderness, the crowd grumbled after a short time of eating the same food every day. They were physically nourished, but there was no variety in the food. It's, it's like a, the guy who every morning complained when he opened, or every day complained when he opened his lunch pail. And he'd say, peanut butter and jelly. That's all I ever get. After complaining for a period of time, a coworker asked, well, why don't you tell your wife that you want something else? The guy looked at him and said, leave my wife out of this. I pack my own lunch. <laughs> we choose the same thing so often that despite our being nourished, we crave something different. For the Hebrews, it was a long journey, and there was no peanut butter or jelly to put on that manna. They hungered for something more. Now, Jesus is talking about bread from heaven, which satisfies us not at the physical level, but at the something more level. Feed on me and never grow hungry, he promises in verse 35. I find it interesting that like so many biblical texts, there are the ones we translate into English, that, that there are sometimes two different words that we translate the same way. What we read as eat is really two Hebrew words. The first one is faj, and it means eat. The second verse, which comes later, is trogen, which is better translated as munch or gnaw. Think about how a dog will enjoy a bone by gnawing on it until there's really nothing and no reasonable nutrients left in it. I think about that when I was writing and reviewing this this morning, that Fran and I kind of eat that way. You know, I'm finished long before she is. I eat. She contemplates. Eats much slower than I do. I'm finished with the uh, with my dinner and, uh, and ready for dessert, and sometimes she hasn't even finished her salad yet. I have to say, we went to, a, went to a 50th wedding anniversary on Friday night for my cousin, and they asked me to give the, give the, uh, the invocation, and, and I thought about what I say to couples who come to be married, and particularly as we're getting ready to do the vows because I believe that God has a strange, strange, strange sense of humor. Look how different he made us. And I say to couples now, someday, I know you're feeling so good, you're in love, all the hormones are raging, but someday you're gonna wake up, you're gonna look across the pillow, you're gonna look at that blob on the other side of the bed and you're gonna say, oh my God, what have I done? On those days, what will keep you together is your vows, your vows. Well, Jesus, I think, is more satisfied if Fran gnaws on her food than if I eat it and it just goes across my tongue and down my throat. She gets more taste, probably. But maybe that's what Jesus is saying. He wants us to be nourished. He wants us to gnaw on the word, spiritually consuming the nutrients until there appears to be none left. 
Many of us become dependent in our lives on quick meals. We're not so concerned how good for us it is. As long as it tastes good, we'll eat it. The high calorie counts, high cholesterol levels, and sugar contained in most fast foods bears witness to that. It sells a lot. Look, I love a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Just love it. But you know, most of you know that I've been on a journey of losing weight for the last several years, and so I log, I log everything that I eat. Well, almost everything. When I cheat, I don't love that. But I, but I try to keep track of it. And the first, so when we, we go to Chick-fil-A, the first thing I do is look at what I want, and then I look at how many calories. I have to adjust the rest of my, the rest of my uh, meals for the rest of the day. And I've got to tell you that sometimes there ain't nothing left by the time we get through lunch. Those are bad days. Those are bad days. Nevertheless, the food's not really good for us. Any of the fast food stuff is not particularly good for us. And sometimes that's the way it is with our spiritual food, too. We look for a quick meal, and, and, and like the fast junk food, there's a lot of quick fix spiritual food out there. Spiritual food is found in gift shops, in pithy sayings that hang on the wall of your dining room. And if you expect to get all of your spiritual food on Sunday morning from your preacher, you will wither up on the spiritual vine because you do not get enough nourishment. Even reading one of the daily devotionals which we provide for you won't do the job. Knowing God's will for you means getting serious about your spirituality. If you want to swim, you can't just sit on the dock and dangle your feet in the water. You have to jump in and let the nourishment of the water support you. That's the way you really need to grow your faith. By immersing yourself in the living water and consuming the bread of life, our bread from heaven. To do so means listening to a sermon differently. Asking yourself, what's in this for me? What's God saying to me? What is it I need to take away from the sermon? How does it challenge me to be a better Christian? Get a good Bible dictionary, one of the many commentaries that will help you understand what you're reading when you read your Bible. Ask yourself as you read, what does God have in this reading for me today? Pray before and after you do daily devotions. Yeah, I said daily. Ask for God's guidance and, and ask God to make this work real in you as you read it. When you've finished your devotions, ask God to continue to reveal his insights for you throughout the day. Reflect on your life, your beliefs, your attitudes, your behaviors in comparison to Jesus' words. Get yourself into a good Bible study that will challenge you beyond your comfort level. Find the living word What's real today for you? Don't be satisfied with yesterday's leftovers. God has new nourishment for you every day. Now, I know that this is a difficult work. I'm asking you to stop spouting the cliches that you learned a long time ago in Sunday school. I'm asking you to take solid food that is more nourishing than the simple foods you heard when you were a child. I'm going out on the limb here. There's probably nothing wrong with what you've been taught. However, it is necessary to look for the deeper meaning in the passages. Have you noticed that I frequently give you a significant amount of context when I preach? I believe that unless we understand the context, and in many cases how the words are used, we cannot understand the meaning of the words. Like when someone uses the word here, what does that mean? Here. Did I mean at this spot? Or did I mean as in here, as in listen? Because we understand the context in which the word is used, that enables us to find the meaning. Well, I could go on, but I think you get the point. 
if we're going to be fed by the bread of heaven, we need to do more than just pick up the crumbs. If we're going to be nourished by the bread from heaven, we need to gnaw on it until the bone given to a, like a bone given to a dog, until all the nourishment has been consumed. Let's pray. Loving Father, your word is food for our souls and refreshment for our hungry hearts. Thank you for sending your son into the world to be the bread that came down from heaven to feed our hungry souls and give life to those that are dead in their sin. Thank you for the person and work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep us from carnal desires, establish our hearts, and strengthen us with his life day by day. In his name we pray, amen. Now go out from here and live lives worthy of the one calling which we share in humility and gentleness and patience. Speak only what is true and loving and so grow into the unity that is ours in Christ. And may God the creator reshape your hearts. May Christ Jesus, the bread of life, sustain you always and may the Holy Spirit unite you in the bond of peace. Amen.